As we've been journeying through the Gospel of Matthew, we've been seeing here in the last several weeks, uh, Jesus kind of responding to the religious people. And especially in chapter 23, the response for them was not such good news, right? They were hypocrites, vipers, fools. Uh, you know, imagine you were repeatedly called that. You would either get really mad, which is what they choose, or start to think about what is being said, which they decided not to do, which would have been helpful. Instead, they got angry. But as that happens, then Jesus is going to kind of give a final pronouncement and kind of walk away from them for the last time, which will lead us into chapter 24, where he's going to talk about signs about the end of the age. Woo! Everyone's like, yes, this is great! You know, or you're like, no, this is not great. It is great. Don't worry. Signs are everywhere, right? We, there's all kinds of signs, right? <coughs> Maybe you... There's a lot of things you can't do. Because a sign told you so. This one's kind of a funny sign. <laughs> it's a new policy. If you don't pick up your kids... <laughs> No, uh, this sign was pretty good. <laughs> you know who you are, stop. <laughs> You're the ones that are like... <laughs> yeah. uh, this sign might be true. <laughs> Hopefully not true. Signs are all around. There, there are signs we take, we use all over our lives. And spiritually, there are signs. There are signs to help us gauge, are we on the right track, spiritually speaking? Some of those are the fruit of the Spirit. Is, are there fruit in your life? That's a sign that you're maturing or not. Yeah. Is there more love, more joy, more peace, more kindness, more patience, more long-suffering, more faithfulness, more gentleness? Or not. Those are signs for the Christian life. Are you living the Christian life? Are you drawing close to Jesus? Is Jesus being reflected in and through your life? You're like, well, what if those signs are not there? You probably should do something about that. Right? Signs aren't just there for decoration. No, bridge is out. Oh, that's just a recommendation. No, that probably means the bridge is out. Don't go that way. <laughs> Unless you're, like, real stubborn. Yeah. Well, I saw the Dukes of Hazard. They can jump the bridge. It's fine. <laughs> That's taking way back. Yeah. What we have in our hands is God's Word, and it's filled with signs. Filled with instructions, filled with things for us to learn and know, not just for information, but so that we come close to Jesus, and that we would follow Him. Sometimes, the signs are not so clear. And you read it, and you go, not a clue. If you've been with us on Wednesdays, you'd be seeing some of those signs, and they'd start to make more sense. In Leviticus, for example. Like, there's things there that make sense? Yes. <laughs> yes, there are. And as we get to end times things, sometimes there are things that people think that don't make sense. But sometimes it's because, well, they're not taking the Bible literally. Literally? Yeah, taking it for what it means. Taking it in their usual, natural, and most basic sense, as opposed to reading them, the words, in figurative, metaphorical, mystical, or allegorical sense. When we read the Bible, when we study the Bible, you need to take what it says, and it means what it says, unless it tells you otherwise. Unless it says, the kingdom of God is like. Then you know the kingdom of God is not that, but it's, like, it's an example. Or it's poetry. Otherwise, literal understanding. It's, if the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense, lest it end up making no sense or nonsense. But that's what sometimes happens when it comes to especially end times and the things of God and what's to come. Why? Because they have an idea, and so they have to rearrange, they have to figuratively imagine what the Word says, rather than just go, well, here's what Jesus said, let's just go with that. It's always a good thing to keep in mind. In regard to this chapter and the next, John MacArthur says the teaching of the Olivet Discourse, which it's sometimes called, is much debated and frequently misunderstood, largely because it is viewed through the lens of our particular theological system or interpretive scheme that makes the message appear complex and enigmatic. You can write that one up later. 
The disciples were not learned men, and Jesus' purpose was to give them clarity and encouragement, not complexity and anxiety. The intricate interpretations that are sometimes proposed for this passage would have left the disciples utterly dumbfounded. It is preferable to take Jesus' words as simply and as straightforwardly as possible. And that's what we're going to do. As we go through this teaching, this section of Scripture, we're going to take it and get, that's what it is. That's what it means. We don't have to like wonder. We're, we're going to be able to see. Jesus says what he means. He means what he says. Before we get to chapter 24, we have to finish chapter 23. We didn't quite do that. And so we back up to verse 37 of chapter 23. Remember, this is after Jesus has pronounced all these woes on the scribes and Pharisees. All these, hey, you're hypocrites. Um, it's not going to go well for you. And so what does he say? Verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jerusalem is representative here of the nation as a whole. And he's saying, you, you didn't listen. You didn't draw near. I wish you would have. I was ready to receive you. And I came in that purpose and manner. And you have rejected me. Just as the prophets did. Just as those before you have. And really it becomes a lament. He's, he's upset. He's crying. He's, he wished things were different. But they weren't. And so it becomes a judgment. That the Messiah, he's going to go away. The Davidic dynasty that they were looking for, that the Messiah was a part, it's not going to happen yet. It, it will happen. But right now, no. They missed the prophet saying this was what the Messiah would be like. The proclamation of John the Baptist and the Messiah himself, Jesus. And yet they said, no, thank you. We'll pass. And so the attention of Scripture and of the life of Jesus is going to turn to the church. And so we see in the book of Acts the birth of the church and the, the pause, if you will, with the nation of Israel. And he quotes from Psalm 118, verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Keep that in mind. Because he is coming. Chapter 24 begins this way. It says, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these? Do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. He's leaving the temple area. This is the last time he's going to be conversing with the religious guys. This chapter 24 25 is a sermon with the disciples, with those he loved. They get to hear what's coming. The, the religious guys are being rejected because they rejected him, so he's leaving the temple area for the last time. But doesn't he come back? Well, he's going where? He's going to Bethany, where his friends were, to hang out, to prepare for what's to come. What's to come? Well, what's to come is he comes back into Jerusalem. They go and have Passover in the upper room. What's to come after that? He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. The disciples falling asleep and all of that. We'll come to that soon. After that, arrest. Trials through the night. Crucifixion. That's what's to come. He knows. The disciples are like, where are we going? Look at all these buildings. This is amazing. I wish we knew what was coming next is what they're going to be asking. Jesus is not unaware. He knows what's coming next. He has it all in mind as he has had for quite some time. It would be nice, wouldn't it, to, to know what's coming next in your life? To have it mapped out? To have a plan that you could just lay out and follow? To, Next week, this is going to happen. You know, maybe you have a calendar, and there are certain things that are on it. You know, this is due then, that is due, this bill, that due, bill. You know, here's where my vacation is, here's where Christmas is. It's the same time every year. Uh, there are various things that could be going on that you are planning out, but a lot of our life, there's a fluidity to it. You don't know what's coming around the corner. But Jesus knows. He's not unaware what's coming around the corner for you and for me. We don't have to be afraid of what's coming next. Why? Because Jesus says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. 
It says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, you don't have to fear what the future holds. Even if you think it's scary, or this might happen, or that might happen, you don't know what's going to happen. Trust Jesus. They were trusting in something that they could see. That's the implication. As they look at the buildings of the temple, the temple complex, they were in awe. See, this temple, these buildings, it was impressive. It's been standing for nearly a thousand years, originally built by Zerubbabel and Ezra, but has been expanded greatly by Herod the Great. Josephus, the Jewish historian, says that for eight years, 10,000 men were kept at work building this temple. In fact, it was nearly 500 yards long, 400 yards wide. It started this rebuild in 19 BC. It wasn't finished until 63 AD. An 80 year rebuilding process. You know, like, yeah, we only had like summer construction season. You know, we <laughs> complaining because we have to sit at the lake for an extra half an hour. 80 years of rebuilding. It wasn't just big though, it was beautiful. It was covered with gold plates. To look at it with the sun reflecting on it, on it would be blinding. From a distance where there was no gold, the, the marble stones looked as white as snow. It was impressive. There were stones that were 37 feet long, 12 feet high, and 18 feet thick. It was impressive. But it also was a source of tremendous pride. Look what, where we go to worship. Look how great our God is. This structure. They were impressed by it. Jesus is not impressed by it. He says, look, you see all this? Not one stone left here will be left upon another. Imagine, you're one of the disciples. You just left and are leaving this magnificent complex, the Temple of the Mount. Wow, that's pretty good. Man. You think Jesus... Yeah, it's all going to be destroyed. How could you say that? There's no way. Peter will go on later, and he understands in 1 Peter 2, 5, to say that we're living stones. He transitions from being impressed with a building to understanding that we are the building, the body of Christ. Living stones being built upon what? The foundation of Christ, the cornerstone. Much more impressive than a building. Look at our building. It, it's not the building that matters. Although we're working on it. Slowly. <laughs> like a turtle. You know. A little bit here, a little bit there. There's parts that we keep want to tweak, and you know, and all these things are happening. What's most important? Not the building, it's the hearts. That our hearts are upon the Lord. This prophecy of Jesus was literally fulfilled in 70 AD, the lifetime of the hearers. What happened? Well, the Romans under Titus came in to destroy Jerusalem. They were trying to save the temple, and a fire accidentally started. And what happened? The gold started to melt. Well, can you imagine? All the soldiers, gold! Mm -hmm. So they started taking all the stones apart, so that not one stone left upon another. They've excavated where the temple was, and they've been able to confirm. You know, there were just stones kind of off laying around. There wasn't two it was all separate. <laughs> What's important about that? Well, Jesus gave prophecy about something to come, and all of what's going to fall in chapter 24 and 25 are about end times events. So he starts with something that can be proven in their lifetime. So that literally came true. It tells them and it tells us everything else that he's going to talk about is literally going to come true. What he did... What he did with that was decide and, and do something that the Old Testament prophets did. They would have a prophecy that would come true quickly, and so the people would go, is he a prophet? Well, they said this would happen, and that happened, so yeah. You know, they weren't weathermen, you know, who were right, you know, 37% of the time, and, you know, got stoned. No, they, they were either a prophet who spoke for God or who weren't. So the things that they said that they could show and demonstrate that they were from God would come true. They're like, oh. So the things that haven't happened yet from those prophets, people know, we, we know, and are to understand, they will also literally come true. 
verse 3, it says, He sat on the Mount of Olives, looked something like that. The disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The sign? The sign is that distinguishing mark by which something is known, an object, quality, or event, whose presence or occurrence indicates the probable presence or occurrence of something else. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Your coming, the pro your appearing, your personal presence. What are they looking for? What are they expecting? They're expecting and looking for a literal reign of Jesus on earth from Jerusalem. That is going to be helpful as we go through the rest of this chapter in the next several weeks. Why? They are Jews, in case you forget. You know, the disciples were all Jews. Jesus was a Jew. They all had a Jewish prophetic mindset, a Messianic Jewish mindset. Say what? What that means is their understanding of the Messiah is gripped and changed and formulated by the Old Testament prophets. And they say some things about the Messiah who would come and reign and rule in the new kingdom. It's why the disciples were always asking, hey, are you going to set up the kingdom at this time? Are we going to have a kingdom? In fact, after the resurrection, chapter 1 of Acts, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They missed the part where he kept saying, I'm going away. The kingdom? See, they're looking for Jesus to come in and take out the Romans. They've had enough of being under the thumb of someone else. They've been under the thumb of the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and now the Romans. They've been eagerly waiting for a Messiah. As far as they can tell, they believe Jesus is the Messiah. The prophets declared some things about the Messiah, where he would be born, all these kind of details. Check, 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 check. There would be a forerunner, not the car. It was John the Baptist. And they're like, okay, that's another big check. And then, oh, Messiah, what will he do? He will reign and rule, his literal presence. So the coming has to do with the literal, abiding, physical presence of Jesus on earth. That's what they were looking for. That's what they're expecting. They're expecting it, you know, tomorrow, next week. That, that was their, what will be the sign of it? Well, is it Thursday? You know, is it, what day will you be coming? That's, their mindset is, it's happening now. What will be the sign? Jesus is going to give them an answer that is also enraptured in and in close proximity to the Jewishness of their question. Their understanding of what the end times is all about. When they are referring to the end of the age, when will the end come and when will you come a second time? That's one event and it's the end of what? It's the beginning of the millennial period when he will reign and rule from Jerusalem. That's the end of the age. This is not doomsday, the end of the world. This is the end of the age as we know it. Until then, what? Till Jesus reigns and rules from earth. So keep that in mind as Jesus answers. He says in verse 4, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. So the first thing is, deception is possible, and will one day be probable. Their end times, eschatological viewpoint, their study of end times has to do with as I mentioned, Jesus reigning and ruling. He's, they're like, what will be the sign? When is it going to happen? First thing he says is, don't be led astray. Don't be deceived. The implication is you can be deceived. You can be led astray. And many will say, I'm the Christ. Many will say, oh, I'm going to follow that Christ. Don't do that, he says. Why? Well, is that something we need to worry about then? I mean, if this is a Jewish answer, we don't need to worry about it, right? Well, no. Because there's still many over the years who have said they are the Christ. Many who said, hey, follow me. You know, I've got a new religion. I've got a new slant on things. You just need my book. You just need to join my club. You know, my group 
in this ranch or something. You know, just you know, drink this Kool-Aid. Uh, <laughs> that didn't turn out so well. Uh, and yet, what can we do? Well, 1 John 4, 1 says we should not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. There's all kinds. Deception runs rampant in our world today. It's not a sign that the end is here yet. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But you just look around. There's all kinds of people that espouse, hey, this is the truth about and fill in the blank. This is the way you get to God. Well, we're not even sure there's God. This is just the truth. You just need all kinds of deception. If you don't know what the Word says, you're going to fall prey to it. In fact, eventually, many will. We test the spirits. Jesus will say and said in John 5, 43, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in, my, in his own name, you will receive him. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking to the Jews. Hey, hey, you didn't receive me. I'm the Messiah. But another's going to come, an Antichrist. You're going to receive him. It seems incredible. You think, that's no, there's no way they will fall for that, will they? Oh, they will. Stay tuned. What are we to do? 2 Timothy 2.15 Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightfully handling the word of truth. That's why we say, hey, just get in the word, let the word get in you. Just take it literally, it makes sense, go with that. Don't try to create some kind of meaning, let the text give you the meaning. And study what it says, so that when others come with these other ideas, you're like, no, that seems a little off. Like, what do you mean off? Well, Here's what it says in Matthew. You're going to be like, what? Or you're like, it just seems off, but I don't know why. Then you have to dig and study. Or use Google. Uh, just be careful where the source comes from when you do that. Study and show yourself approved. Timothy, the time is coming when people not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, or turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Well, that's going on now. But it's been going on for a long time. Hmm. Deception is possible. In fact, the deception will lead all the way to the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, you can make a note of it. It says, And he will make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolated. Revelation 6, 1 and 2 talks about the rider on a white horse. He will start with peace, but will lead many astray. Why? Because deception will become rampant. When? During this period that Jesus is talking about. It's the period of the tribulation. We'll get into that more. Not only will there be deception, but verse 6, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Wars will happen. There's almost not a time on earth where wars have not happened. If you do a study or you do some searching on wars, it's overwhelming. They, they start to categorize it by how many people have died in the war, not just how many wars there have been. Ongoing conflicts right now? All of those places. Jesus says, don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. Yeah, don't be troubled. Don't raise an outcry. Why? Because it must happen. Nation must go against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. Yeah, well, what should we do with that? Well, it's like when we pray each Wednesday for the top 50 most persecuted nations of the world, which may include many of those. What are we doing that for? Well, because we have it so good. We're not having war going on right now. You know, you're not ducking in cover at the sound of a mortar or something. You're not having to hide behind cars because someone's got a gun all the time, every day, on your way to school, to church, to work. Right? We're not in a war zone. Like, well, culturally, we're in a war zone. It's really bad. Yeah, it's not the same. Not the same. Wars are happening. So what should we do with all of that that's going on? We can be really sad about it. Oh, that's horrible. But we can pray. 
and not be alarmed. I think we should pray. We should be continually in prayer and bring peace to those places. Bring peace to those situations, to the Christians there. Give them courage. To those that aren't yet Christians, help them know Jesus. Bring someone into their life in the midst of that horror that they would find Christ before it was too late. Just don't be troubled. What should we do? It's John 16, 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Take that, Avengers. Jesus has overcome the world. He doesn't need help. He has overcome the world. It's like, well, if I'm in one of those countries, I'm not feeling the peace. No, there's a peace that Jesus gives that passes all understanding. If we could interview someone from some of these countries in war-torn places, maybe some of them will be like some of us who are just full of complaints and gripes and, you know, rather than joy and thanksgiving, but I think many of them would be like, it's been pretty crazy, yeah. Lost a grandpa, an uncle, a brother. But in the midst of all that, God's been so good. There's a peace. I, I don't know why. We just know we might die. But Jesus is on the throne. I mean, we'll be humble to get to heaven, to meet some of these people who have been killed in wartime or who have been persecuted for their faith and be like, you're the heroes. We had it easy. When you're not experiencing the peace of God, it's not because He's moved. It's because we moved. He's always there. So draw near so that you have His peace and in the midst of whatever trial, tribulation you're going through, Go to Jesus. He has overcome the world. Not a pill, not a bottle, not whatever else you would try to fix the problem with. Go to Jesus. He overcomes everything. Famines and earthquakes? Those are, those are going on. Yeah, but it's going to get really bad. Revelation 6. 6 says, And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and wine. And it speaks to there's going to be all kinds of economic problems in that day because crops are going to be not very cheap. Verse 8. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Oh. All these what? Wars, earthquakes, famines, deceptions. These are the beginnings of birth pains. They're like, beginning of birth pains? Well, those don't come in the third month. They don't come in the seventh month of pregnancy. The birth pains come right before the birth, right? And what happens in the birth pains? They increase in what? Regularity and severity. So I hear. That's what the women say. Right? The birth pains, they get worse as it gets closer to being better. <laughs> True? True. Yeah. Unless you have, like, you know, a shot or something so you don't feel anything. You're like, <laughs> Anyway. Uh, <laughs> not a clue. Just making that clear. The birth pains for the end of the age means it's right near the end. These aren't birth pains, the famines, the earthquakes, the wars that are going on right now. That's not, these are not the end. Why? Because the end's going to come suddenly, quickly. In fact, that's what this seven-year period is all about. And specifically, as we'll talk, the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. Now you're talking the end is near. The world has been this way for a long time. Romans 8, 22 says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. All these things are just the beginning of the birth pains. Verse 9, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world 
as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. What should we expect, disciples? They should expect that things would get worse and worse as the end draws closer and closer. Sometimes you hear that people say, hey, it's going to get better and better before Jesus comes. No, the Bible says it's going to get worse and worse. It's going to get bad, really bad. Until what? Until the end of the age. What is that again? That's right before Jesus comes again in appearance to set apart a thousand years where he reigns and rules. It's Matthew chapter 19, where they were talking about the future kingdom. And Jesus says, hey, truly I say to you, verse 28, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who will follow me will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. When will that be? That won't be heaven. There will be no judging to do in heaven. Everyone in heaven is there, you know. We won't be sinning anymore. There's no judging necessary. During the millennial period, that's when they'll be sitting on the thrones, judging and being his emissaries. That's the end of the age. A literal earthly kingdom. It means God's not finished with Israel. God's got a plan for them. Spurgeon says, in regard to this time period, here's something to tremble at. Because iniquity shall abound, that is worse than pestilence. The love of many shall wax cold. That is worse than persecution. As all the water outside a vessel can do it no hurt until it enters the vessel itself. So outward persecutions cannot really injure the church of God. But when the mischief oozes into the church and the love of God's people waxes cold, ah, uh, then the bark is in sore distress. See, it says they'll deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. Well, that, that happened for the disciples, right? But then it says, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. If you think about the nation of Israel, because this is Jews asking a question, Jesus is responding in like manner, that's the context. Well, right now, not all nations hate the Jews, right? They have some friends, of which we are one of, most of the time. Uh, and other countries that are friends of the Jewish people and of the nation of Israel, they have a right to exist. We believe that, right? There will come a time when no one stands with them. They're like, oh no, we will always stand with them. Nope. Oh. It might be because there's no more Christians left. Because of this thing called the rapture. Like, the who? The what? That's not even in the Bible, is it? It is. We'll get to it. There'll be many false prophets. People will betray one another. The lawlessness will be increased. He's specifically talking about this seven-year period. He says the one who endures to the end will be saved. Like, that's how you get saved? You get to go through it all? Oh, yeah. I read that book. It was the Tribulation Saints. That's what I'm going to be. I'm going to be a Tribulation Saint. I'm going to be hiding from the Antichrist. Undercover. Not so much. Why? If you're going to get saved during the seven-year period, which the Bible tells us some people will, specifically Jews, but also some Gentiles, thousands will, guess what? Most will get beheaded for that. That's your way through. <laughs> some will endure to the end, and they'll live on into the millennial period. Yeah, That's not a great option, just FYI. Go with the option of, I trust Jesus today, so when he comes for his church, you go with him. And you're not part of life here on earth during those seven years. Like, oh, I didn't think it was, it'll be too bad. It won't be so bad. It's going to be bad. Most people are going to die from famine, pestilence, disease, wars, all kinds of messes, and then the judgments of God notwithstanding in the second half of the tribulation period. Yeah, it's not going to be good. Then it says, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all generations all nations. And then the end will come. Like, what? Yeah, that's when all the gospel goes to every country, isn't it? Yeah, kind of. But here's what's going to happen during those seven years. There's going to be two witnesses, and then there's going to be 144,000 witnesses. You're like, that's what I want. I want to be one of those witnesses. Are you Jewish? No. You're not going to be. Oh. 
Isn't there like a whole group of people who think there's 144,000 of them already set aside to do? Yeah, that's not them. No. Just go with what the Bible says and you'll be a lot better off. But then what does he say? There's going to be an angel. Revelation chapter 14. Flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation, tribe, and language, and people. You say with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. That's how the whole world's going to know. Oh. Yeah. Cosmic angel. Somehow, they're make the message known to everyone, 144,000 witnesses, the gospel will be proclaimed throughout the whole world through that seven year period. And then, the end will come. Like, yeah, I thought it was when the last Gentile gets saved, that's when the end will come. What, what's with that? Well, Romans 11, 25, I think it is about, does say something to that, the times of the Gentiles will end, is how it's phrased, something like that. What does that mean? I think that refers to when the rapture comes, there's no more Gentiles, so God's directing now to the people of Israel, the Jewish nation, to do what with them? To purify them, to draw them to himself, and to bring judgment on those who don't believe. That's when the times of the Gentile. Could it be when there's the last Gentile gets saved that that is what it refers to? Perhaps. But it could be just the season, the time of the church age. Why? Because there's going to be Gentiles who get saved in the tribulation period. It won't be easy for them. In other words, there's nothing left for Jesus to return for the church. All of these signs are in reference to the tribulation period. When we get to verse 15 in what, eight seconds, then that's going to be referring to a great sign about that period of time and the end of the age. Verse 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And also for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, these days will be cut short. The abomination of desolation. All these other things were birth pains. This is going to be a sign that you'll know it's going down. To then have the great tribulation. What? Yeah, that last three and a half years. Some have said that these events have already happened in 70 AD. You know, because Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed. So these things already happened, except for, well, one commentator said it this way, the desolating sacrilege is a literal Greek rendering of the phrase an abomination. An Old Testament idiom is an adulterous affront to the true worship of God. And so that didn't happen in 70 AD. They didn't set up an altar and say, you must worship me. They just destroyed everything. So this is something still to come. Now the problem right now is there's no temple in Jerusalem. What's there? Oh, a mosque. Yeah. Where there should be a temple. Now some have said, well, the mosque could be here and the temple will be here. Either way, right now there's no temple. So there can be no abomination that causes desolation yet. That's why he's going to come, Daniel chapter 9, and make peace with Israel. And not just with Israel, it's going to be a lasting peace. It's going to be a seven-year peace treaty. Everyone will be on board. They're like, this is great, we finally have peace in the Middle East. That's what people are always trying to do. Every president, I'm going to bring peace to the Middle East. No, well, you're not. Good luck. Ah! It's not going to happen. So anyone who says that, you just know they're lying. They mean well, they're just lying. It just won't happen. Why? Because they're not the Antichrist. Like, How do you know? They're not European. They're not the head of a European Union and the one world leader. They like to think they are. Yeah. But they're not. Daniel chapter 9 tells about this Antichrist. He's going to come and make peace with Israel. People are going to be so excited. It's going to be so wonderful until the midpoint. 
He's going to enter in. He's going to desecrate it in some way and declare himself God. Set up a statue. People must follow and worship me. And Jesus says, when you see that, run. Like you've never run before. Run where? Why does he say those in Judea? Why? Because he's talking to the Jews. The church is gone. The world history, the epicenter is going to be Jerusalem. Everything's going to be focused there. The whole focus of the world will be there. And so he's telling those who are in Judea, in Jerusalem, in that area, flee, get out of town, run, run. To where? Where are they going to go? They're going to flee to Petra and to some areas in southern Jordan and southern Israel where God will supernaturally protect them. See, this temple meaning, this temple complex couldn't have happened. They wouldn't have had time to flee the way things went down accidentally. It wasn't a, you must worship us or we're going to kill you all. Run if you can. No, it was we destroy it all and that was the end. So God's going to protect them. Revelation chapter 12. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days, which is three and a half years. Uh, the second half of the seven year period is a time of great tribulation. Jacob's trouble, the Bible calls it. Why? Because it's a time where God is dealing with the nation of Israel and bringing judgment upon the earth. He's refining the Jewish people, so that they will see and go, this is not the Messiah. Jesus is Messiah. And many will come to Him. Many will run and escape. He said, but hope you're not pregnant. Hope you're not nursing. You know, hope, hope it's not winter. Like, why? What's on it? Because those will all be problems for you to get away quickly. Hope it's not a Sabbath. That doesn't concern us because we're not under the law of the Sabbath. It concerns the Jews who, in Israel, everything shuts down on the Sabbath. We go to an elevator, all the floors stop on the Sabbath. Why? So that no one has to touch a button and work on the Sabbath. Very convenient. Unless you want to go to the 8th floor, you've got to stop at every floor in between. Or the 80th floor, can you imagine? <laughs> One. <laughs> Two. <laughs> hey, and they open. <coughs> Close. Three. I mean... There's, travel will be a problem if it was on the Sabbath. It's to the Jews. The days would have been cut short. If not for the elect. The elect? I thought we were the elect. What is all that? No, the Jews are also the elect. This sign is huge. It's Daniel chapter 12 also. The end may be determined. It's the critical sign mentioned here in Matthew chapter 24. This abomination that causes desolation. It's the warning to flee. It's a sign of the consummation of all things from Daniel chapter 9, 27. It's foreshadowed by that guy. <laughs> that was an event that occurred before Christ. But the final fulfillment of that scripture is in the Antichrist. Tells us exactly how many days are left. Second Thessalonians three or two finally reveals that this was not a nice guy. This was Satan incarnate, if you will, the Antichrist. Not your friendly neighborhood, you know, world ru ruler. He's there to take over and to kill everybody if they don't worship him. The image of the beast. If you don't worship, you can kill. This seven year period, this last three and a half years there, those that can get away will get away. God will supernaturally protect them. The days will be cut short to three and a half years. See, Daniel chapter 9 tells us about these weeks and these years that are described. He has 77 would equal 490 years because a week is a week of years or seven years. Of these 490 years, there's one week that has not been fulfilled. One seven-year period that still has to be fulfilled. That's what this tribulation period is. That's what Jesus is talking about here. 
when the Antichrist comes and he makes a covenant with Israel for seven years. Everyone will be like, this is great. The temple will be rebuilt. Sacrifices will be going again until this point. And he declares himself to be God. That's when the problem happens. Why? Because it's Jacob's trouble. And when he's revealed, he can't be revealed at this point. Why? Well, because the restrainer is here. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 12, 6. The restrainer? The Holy Spirit in the body of Christ. Because we're still here, the whole Antichrist is not here. Like, well, he may be here, he's just not here. Why? Because the, Satan doesn't know when the end will be. So all throughout history, he's had to have someone ready. Some evil person who could at the right time, in the right place, in the right moment, rise up and be the Antichrist. Like, I don't know. Just think about some of the people through history. It makes sense. This period of time is going to be judgment, but also purification. St. Adam says, God uses its judgment to punish the wicked and to purify the Jews. This time of punishment would have no bounds if it were not for the goal of purification. That's why it will end. That's why there will be an end point to it where Jesus comes once again. He says, let the reader understand. He says, if anyone says to you, verse 23, look, here's the Christ, well, there he is, do not believe it. The false Christ and false prophets will arise, will perform great signs and wonders as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. In other words, just because they can do a good trick doesn't mean they're of God. Oh, that's powerful for us today. See, I've told you beforehand, if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. We'll get into that a little more next week. What does that all do for us then? I mean, if this is all for the Jew, because we're going to be gone, like, well, I think we're going to be here. Oh, good. Then you know what's going to happen. That's good. I think we're going to be gone. We'll be showing that as we go. And it's okay to disagree. We'll talk about it, the marriage supper of the Lamb after we are raptured. <laughs> no. uh, Jesus wants us to know. He wanted the disciples to know something that was going to be beyond their lifetime. Like, well, that's not helpful, is it? Because they were looking for, like, next week, tomorrow, when's this going to happen? Jesus like, hey, just slow down a little. It's coming. You're not even going to see it. Like, why would he give that? Remember, Jesus told them he doesn't know the day of the hour. So it's available for us all to read and understand. That day is coming. That, that time of tribulation is coming. So that it means before that time, the church is going to go up. We'll show where that scripturally is. Don't worry, I'm not just making it up. And what does that do for us then? If we're not going through all of that, why should we know about it? It tells us God's not done with Israel. Jesus loves Israel and Jewish people, so we should love and care for and pray for the nation of Israel and the people of Israel, no matter what. No matter what government does or doesn't do, we stand with, not secularism, we stand with they're God's people. Right? Because not everyone in Israel today serve God. Same as in America. But we want to be on God's side, so we probably should be on the Jewish side. God wants us to care. Jesus wants us to care. He's telling us all this information so that if we're not going to be here, like, why well, just put a little big parenthesis? Except for the church, you don't need to worry about it. This is just for the Jews. You know? But he doesn't. But the way he lays it out, we can all clearly understand. So what should that do for the church, the body of Christ, for you and for me? Well, I think it should cause us to have a heart for the Jews, a heart for the lost who will go through and into this period of time and will most likely die in this period of time if they're alive when it starts, as millions will. It's not going to be a joyous occasion, a great time. It's going to be horrible. So the job for you and me is to do what Jesus said. You are salt and light. 
in light of what's coming, it doesn't bring fear and trembling. It's like, okay, there's a lot going on. We're moving towards these birth pains. It's not yet, but it just means it's getting really close. It means we could leave at any moment. Twinkling, maybe that, we're already gone. Twinkling of a, if you're still here after that, here's the playbook. Right? I even got extra notes. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six is the password. <laughs> I won't need it. <laughs> so then I might have to change that. <coughs> yeah, no. Jesus wants us to care and love those who are lost. Those who are looking for hope and for peace and don't have it because they're looking in the wrong places. Allow Him to speak to you. Not out of fear, but out of great love, so that you would have great love for others. Amen? Amen. Father God, we thank you.